now. Anything in just a second. It's recording, so don't. Okay. Trying to get my agenda up on, this, on my own computer. Um, I'll pull it. I'll pull the agenda up. But do you want to call people to order, Andy? Call the finance committee to order, and then I'll call the full council to order. Okay, so I'll start. Uh, good morning. It's a couple minutes at, um, right at nine o'clock or a couple minutes after, and I'm going to call the finance committee meeting of April 12, 2022 to order. And um, we have a quorum of the uh, finance committee here. We also have a quorum of the council. So um, when I finish calling the, um, going through the process of uh, starting the meeting for the finance committee, I will then turn it over to the council president because she's going to want to uh, convene a meeting of the council itself also as soon as I can conclude. So, um, in any event, pursuant to uh, Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom and by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public uh, will be permitted. Uh, this is a uh, meeting that is being convened solely um, as a virtual meeting, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time by technological means, and we will have public comment, um, but the public comment will be late in the meeting, not early in the meeting. And um, I am now going to um, ask the members of the finance committee to indicate um, their presence and uh, th uh, that they can hear and can, so we can confirm uh, that they hear us. And um, I'll start with uh, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Matt Halloway. Present. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present. Shell Miller. Here. Kathy Shane. Kathy. You're muted, so I can't hear you. Here. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm here, and um, I don't believe I've seen Alicia Walker. So, uh, uh, but we do have a quorum with all members, but one currently present. Lynn, I'm going to turn it over to you about uh, convening a meeting of the council. Seeing that we have a quorum with the council present, I'm going to call the council. Uh, together, meeting together, or meeting to order, excuse me, for the finance committee as a joint meeting with the finance committee. And I want to make sure that those counselors who are present can hear us and we can hear them. So I'm going to start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Here. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> no problem. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. I believe that's everyone. Thank you. Okay, so um, our normal process uh, for finance committee meetings is we review the agenda um, as the next item. And uh, so what I'm going to uh, just say is there are essentially three items in addition to public comment that are on the agenda. Uh, the way it's listed, item two is a uh, can actually be at the end of the meeting. It was added as a last minute item, but is really finance committee oriented. 
and uh, we have uh, um, people who are joining us for other agenda items first. So that's going to be the the last item, and uh, we are going to start with the um, what's listed as item three, the FY23 budget review for the regional school district. Uh, it says uh, budget and capital. We will be uh, looking at the operating budget first and then the capital budget of the regional schools, which is a, uh, a separate request, uh, but um, is an important part of the budget. Then um, the water and sewer regulations. We have two people from the Department of Public Works, but we have asked that um, they not join us at the beginning of the meeting unless they want to, because uh, we know we're going to start with schools. So um, unless there's objection from the committee, we will handle that and we'll fit the minutes um, approval and later in the meeting. So um, turning then to the schools, I want to uh, welcome uh, Superintendent Morris and uh, Dr. Slaughter, the finance director of the schools. And um, they made a presentation at the uh, most recent council meeting uh, so that we have the background information already presented. I don't know if there are any additional uh, uh, things that either of you would like to say um, to the committee, sort of to launch the discussion, or if uh, we want to go to questions. So, uh, Dr. Morris. Thank you very much, Andy. So, just uh, briefly, uh, just to recap, uh, I think some of the important pieces of that. Conversation one is that um, the district uh, developed a sort of compromise to satisfy the, the concerns and requests that we received from our four member towns. Uh, this is the first member town where we're having you know, more active discussion. The other three towns, uh, I think just for context, it's important for folks to know, have town meetings, uh, one at the end of this month, and then the other two towns are in mid-May. Uh, so from a process perspective, uh, we need approval of all four towns of both the assessment method as well as the financial dollar amount to move forward with the budget for the region for the next school year. So uh, we appreciate uh, the, the council taking us early. We know this is sort of off schedule uh, for when you're considering the budget, but doing that allows you to weigh in before the other three towns perhaps have already voted. And, and uh, I think it's a much more healthy process. So I really appreciate the, the council and the FinCom. Uh, allowing us to come early. And so the compromise piece was really around getting to a, a more durable, sustainable assessment method. And so what you will uh, what you saw in the presentation last week or have seen in the past, if you're following some of the regional school committee meetings, uh, is moving to a 100% statutory method uh, with a smoothing measure that, that has a five-year smoothing measure rolled into it. And you know we're able to do that in part and make this transition because we do have ESSER funds, uh, which are funds from the Stimulus Act that support our regional schools that helps bridge the gap for us. Uh, we are moving to a place where a year from now in the next budget, we will have sixth graders from the Amherst Elementary Schools attending the regional middle school. There would be a, have to be a financial arrangement sorted out uh, about the rental of space and perhaps portions of staff members like nurses, things, custodians, folks who uh, you know, wouldn't come with their own staff for, for 140, 150 kids. And so that is another part of this uh, whole equation long term about making things more sustainable. So, uh, you know, we, we, we've so far uh, not, we've had a relatively for us a low drama budget year uh, as it relates to regional schools. It's a low bar perhaps because we often have struggles between our four towns uh, about both the assessment method and the dollar amount as well as our community about the services we provide. So uh, we're hoping to continue that, but the, <laughs> we'll see how that plays out. We're open of course to any questions uh, that, that any members have today. Uh, I think uh, the president, the council emailed us a question about uh, an hour ago that probably we weren't able to compile all the information. So please know this isn't the last opportunity to ask questions. If you do have questions, we may not have all the answers if it takes some background research to be able to do it, but we commit to getting back to you to the best of our ability in a timely manner. With that, I'll turn it back to the finance committee and the council. Thank you. Uh, so just to remind everybody of the process that we've established, and uh, then I'll uh, 
get to people who've raised uh, hands to because we're focusing on process right now before we get to substance. Uh, the charter does have a provision that if there is reason to take a um, section of the budget separately, that we have the capacity to do so. Um, that was uh, written into the charter because uh, I was, uh, as a select board member, um, consulting with the Charter Commission about the finance sections with partly with the regional schools in mind because we recognize that this is going to be um, a challenge that and this was the best way to handle it. The, um, there is a requirement in the Charter that there be a budget hearing for all uh, parts of the budget and for the um, and if we take something out of order, the charter does require that we have a budget hearing for the um, that piece before we actually can vote on it. So the plan is that uh, there will be a budget hearing um, at the council meeting on uh, April 25th. April 26th will be a finance committee meeting to talk about um, the and make a final recommendation on the regional school budget and forward it. Um, it, it we do that after the, um, for the, the public hearing because um, we want to be able to consider any public comments. And then um, uh, the plan is that at the May two uh, council meeting that um, we would be able to take a vote. And as will be explained later, that's actually significant date because of the um, capital part of the budget, which is the second part of the discussion on school, regional schools today. So um, I don't know if Lynn has anything else to add to that. And if not, Sean, you had your hand up a minute ago. I, I have nothing, Andy. That was an excellent overview. Thanks. But yeah, you, you, might, you covered everything that I was going to say. Yeah, I want to make sure, though, that if particularly new counselors are, you know, counselors that have returned, if you have questions about the process, we should talk about that now. Okay, seeing no questions about process, um, then um, I guess uh, we should go ahead. Uh, Kathy, do you have something on process or you want to yeah, go? I, I, have, I have a process. I think it's a process timeline, not for what today, but the regional school capital budget. Don't we have to consider that with a up or down earlier than the capital budget we're looking at in June? Don't we have a once it's submitted to us earlier? I'm just looking at the timeline on that. That must that was my question. Okay. Uh, the answer is basically yes, because of the provisions of uh, how the budget process for capital works. And uh, that's why May 2 is a uh, key date. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Uh, Sean? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and I'm sure Doug was going to say this, um, you have 60 days, uh, the, the council has 60 days to act upon the, the vote of the regional school committee, which was on March 15th, right, Doug? Um, so that's why we have the the vote on both the operating budget and the cap capital for the region on May 2nd. So that's within that 60 day window. And can I just follow up when we're voting, are we voting only on FY23, or are we also voting on the possible plan with track and all its glory of glory, meaning more than one version of it? I would defer to Doug to explain the, the capital vote. Okay. I mean, okay. maybe we're getting into substance now, so I can wait on that. Like, I got the first one. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Doug? So uh, what I'll say is this, is that, so there's sort of two parts to capital. There's the capital assessment, which is the part of the budget. That can be a part of the budget. It doesn't have the, the 60 day limit quite the same way the, uh, the, the debt authorization does. So the debt authorization is the one that has the 60 day window in which the, the council would have to take action to either uh, agree with that or disagree with that. 
Um, the actual assessment is just a single year assessment, just like the operating budget is a single year operating budget. Those two are pieces of the overall budget. And the third piece to the, to the overall budget is the assessment method. Um, the debt authorization is a, is a somewhat separate but integrated uh, step that you would take as well. And it's, it's, um, it is just an authorization for an amount to be borrowed. And this, there's two pieces to it, one sort of regular looking capital items and then one larger project, which has some variability to how it may play out. Okay, anything else on process? Because otherwise I'm gonna to turn to the regional budget, uh, the operating budget, Lynn. I, I just wanna acknowledge that it is an unusual capital budget. And when we get to it, uh, we should spend some time on just that piece of it. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, recognize um, anybody who's uh, either a member of the finance committee or a counselor and not a member of the finance committee, just in order of um, people asking uh, to be recognized to, uh, with questions about the budget. And uh, so uh, at this point, if you have questions that you would like to ask about the regional budget, um, please raise your hand and I will uh, be taking, try doing my best to take, recognize people in the order in which they ask uh, for recognition. And um, uh, we'll proceed from there. And I'm gonna um, also ask that if you have a series of questions that um, you um, handle the, uh, you know, you just recognize that there may be a number of people who are asking for recognition. And I don't know who um, suggested the question to Lynn that was posed in advance, but um, not everybody may be aware of what that question is. So I don't know, Lynn, if- It was a question that came from Councillor Shane, and it was to ask for multiple uh, years of comparison of number of students, number of faculty and budget. And for the first last most recent five years, and then in increments of five years, going back up to 20 years. And, and I'll just say, I didn't expect to get those for today, but I think it would be just useful for be, us to be able to see that kind of trend. Um, and uh, you've, and so far we've been provided parts of it. So it's not that we have nothing. So thank you. I also wanna ask um, Dorothy, if you can hear us and Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, then I'll look for uh, people who raise hands and Kathy, your hand is up. So. Uh, okay, so we're focusing first just on operating budget, correct? Correct, and right now I see three hands. So I'm taking it in order that they went up, Kathy. Okay, so um, I may be mixing the discussion a little bit, but as I understand it, you've been able to achieve the projected operating budget, which has an increase of 3.9% for Amherst compared to the guideline that we put out of two and a half, because you've got ESSER funds. Um, and so you're able to uh, do do the current budget without any significant changes in staffing. Um, so I I'm wondering what happens in 24, 25. You know, what what do we if we look out a little bit, what happens when the when there's no ESSER? Um, that's question number one. Um, so I I'll just do my um, second one because it's linked to this. Um, the third grade, sixth grade is scheduled to move up um, in the fall of 23, which is the next FY year, it's FY 24. Does that help um, my, it's related to my question about FY 24, the town will be paying 
rent to the regional school. Um, and I'm wondering if it also helps that uh, there are more students. So the, the cost per student might be down because you can spread art and music and language you potentially got sixth grade with some of those extras. So I'm looking for, you know, if we're okay for this year, tight but okay, what happens uh, a year from now? And I'll stop. Those are, those are my two questions. Doug, do you want to start us off? I can jump yeah, in. Yeah, I will. I can, I can start us off. So um, I'll start with the second one first, I think, in some respects. So, so talking about the sixth grade moving to the, to the, uh, to the middle school, there is some economy that will be uh, gained potentially by staffing in some respects. Uh, you know, there may be some loss of that in, in the elementary schools because, you know, you, you know, for example, let's take a, a nurse. You have to have a nurse in the building. So that cost per student at, say, Wildwood will be a little higher because uh, you'll have the sixth grade out, but you'll still need a full-time nurse there. On the other hand, we'll share a nurse at the middle school. Uh, and so that'll reduce the cost. Uh, some of those things will kind of offset each other. Um, other, but there are other economies that, that won't have uh, an expense on, on sort of the other side of the equation from, from the two districts, that sort of thing. Um, so yes, we'll, you know, we have ESSER funds the current year and next year, uh, we'll probably leverage those in both years to, to sort of smooth the transition uh, as we wait until uh, sixth grade comes online in, in the middle school. Uh, that will provide some, some relief to the regional budget for sure. I think it also will to the, to the Amherst budget. Uh, so we're, we're using those ESSER funds to help kind of bridge that gap of, of time. Um, <clears throat> but it's, you know, it won't be easy. And I think that there are going to be some hard choices we're going to make over the next couple of years um, as, we, as we look at, you know, the staffing levels we have, the number of students we have, the costs we have, uh, and the available funds. And so, you know, ESSER will definitely help us out through the next couple of years. And, and one of the things we'll need to do as we plan for those sixth graders in the middle school is to, to try to... Uh, uh, find the, as many economies we can to help uh, smooth out that that transition in cost and, and that loss of resource from the ESSER funds. I can add just very briefly, um, you know, ESSER funds, we're, we're, we are working hard not to expend all of them uh, quickly. And so we don't know what shape the virus will take. Obviously, we're, we're at a, a period of higher concern than we were a month ago at the moment. And um, I'd love to be right in predicting the future of COVID, but uh, right, if I could do that, I'd take that on the road and, and uh, probably our budget problems will be solved. So uh, I don't want to go there, but it is the case that we do have to be aware that uh, we may have other mitigations that occur in the future, um, but we do have the funds for one more or part of one more fiscal year. So we are looking ahead and, and preserving uh, some amount of funds for budget support for the FY24 budget. Um, and at that point, unless the federal authorities relax their deadline, which I believe they are not slated to do, despite a lot of urging professional organizations like my national one, um, I think that's where the, the cliff that we, we talk about will be. So we do anticipate being able to use some SR funds for budget support uh, for the next, the, the FY24 budget, but FY25, as it currently stands, um, that's where the, that budget support will end. Andy, you're, mu you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, is there anything else you have, Kathy? Otherwise, I'm going to go into Bob. No, my, my other question is a different issue. So go to Bob and then Mandy. You go to the others. Okay, Bob? Yeah, I wanted to focus a little bit on the revenue. Um, I'm looking at the, the, the table on page 20 of the report, and um, I noticed that the transportation reimbursement went up by 100,000 and the END for budget support went up 700 to 700,000, went up 500,000. Um, are these new levels the kind of thing that is going to continue into 24 and 25, or are they one time uh, increases that could uh, re be reduced in the future? Because they obviously would impact the budget tremendously. That's it. So I, I can answer that, and, and I'll start with <clears throat> I'll start with the transportation reimbursement. Um, the recent history of transportation reimbursement has been a little stronger than it has been in previous years, and so they've been able to support us at a little bit higher level. So that's hopeful that it will stay at that that level of of support. Uh, some of it's it's a reimbursement for costs that we incur, so our costs are going up as well. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a wash in some respects. Um, 
you know, hopefully we can we can have and continue to have a fairly decent contract with our with our bus company and, and our own internal systems of, of, of providing transportation. So uh, that's likely to stay fairly steady uh, in and around that that level of, of support. Uh, for E and D, uh, it's a higher use this year. We had a we we finished last year with uh, you know a significant amount of surplus, quite frankly, and so our E and D was was much higher. We had a lot of uh, unknowns as we went through last year, and as a result, uh, you know we we were holding off on spending in order to sort of anticipate and, and be ready for any kind of an extraordinary cost, which didn't materialize, uh, partly because we just weren't in our buildings until. April and May, and so we really just had a lot less uh, expenses, and so our E and D uh, was, you know, uh, which is like reserves for the town, uh, was much higher. Uh, we have a, you know, a, a maximum allowable of E and D that's allowed to us as a result of the action of the last school committee. You know, we're returning uh, money back to the town of Amherst on the order of about three hundred eighty thousand um, dollars, which reduced uh, the burden of, of of this year's assessment uh, to the town. Um, that will. That amount of support for for uh, the budget from E and D will not be as high next year. We typically have about five hundred thousand dollars worth of of support there, so it's a little higher this year. That will be a concern as we head into next year. Uh, that it, you know, as we go into fiscal twenty four, we won't have quite as much uh, ability to support uh, the budget. But nonetheless, we had it available this year, and and still uh, feel like that's a a, a reasonable mechanism to to uh, keep ourselves at a level services budget for the for fiscal twenty three. Bob, anything else? Uh, no, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mandy? Yes, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank you for providing the 174 page um, budget to us. Um, that's something I've been looking for for a while, um, and it was fantastic. It's much better than last year's just line item with all the graphs and explanations and in inclusion of revolving funds and all of that. So thank you for that. And I want to apologize for the harshness I might have taken out on you on my frustration last last council meeting for not having found that or seen that. So um, so thank you for having it. It was very helpful for me to help understand this budget. So I have a question that relates to what Kathy was asking and then something similar to that. The, the staffing changes, um, look like the staff has gone up about 8% in increase in staffing from FY19 to FY23, um, yet our school enrollment has gone down 5%. And uh, most of that staffing appears to be, staffing increase appears to be in the special education department. Um, I've noticed in this budget that the ESSER funds are funding about six staff members this coming year, and that school choice funds have increased tremendously, that um, in the revolving fund for school choice, you're actually supporting the budget more than in typical years, at least it looked like to me, on school choice funds, and that that includes supporting even more staffing um, of the middle and high school through those school choice funds. And so I'm concerned when, is, is the support level at the school choice funds for the operating budget sustainable, um, number one. And then again, with the ESSER funds, if we've moved that support level to six, seven members, school choice is another 11, I think. Um, so we're looking at like 18 staff members supported by funds that may or may not be there in two years or may not be able to be at that level. And then in addition to that, while we're losing students, we're increasing our staffing. Um, I, I just want you to speak to, you covered a little bit about the ESSER staffing and all, but how do we transition away from, you know, the ESSER funds supporting six staff members when they disappear in two years? And, and can you explain also why the staffing seems to be increasing by 8% over five years while the student are decreasing by 5%. And that's the overall student population. Maybe some of it relates to the SPED student population. I just don't know. I couldn't find those numbers. And um, so that's that's one question or group of questions I have is it seems like the staffing level is not compatible with or, or following the, the trend of enrollments. And then the next one that relates to that is um, in the budget, you had a nice um, graph about the percentage of budgets dedicated to various um, sections of the budget, regular education, special education, transportation, school administration, facilities, all of that. And I noticed something that 
over the last four years, the actual dollar amount spent on reg regular education has decreased, not, not by like the actual dollars. And it's only one of three areas that the actual dollars have decreased. And so that concerns me that we're spending less money on the bulk of students getting their education um, and more money on nearly every other category. The only other categories that actually decreased were school administration and facilities. Um, so can you talk about why the actual spending in regular education over the last four years in actual dollar amounts, this is not you know, set for inflation or anything has gone down um, and how that, um, you know, how those choices are made to spend less money on re regular education and more money on various other areas within the budget. Okay. So hopefully I'll get all of those in, in this answer. So I'll start with this, this sort of school choice. School choice is traditionally and has and will remain to be a, uh, a fairly steady source of income uh, for the regional schools. We have used it to support uh, staffing. We traditionally use it in the regional schools in our mathematics departments. Um, the number of FTE may fluctuate in some respects by virtue of who our staff are and what they cost. And so the FTE varies depending on who our staff are and what you know, sort of grade and step they are at. Uh, so it, it does vary a little bit just independent of how many dollars we commit to it by virtue of what the cost of those staffing uh, are. Um, that being said, it is a higher level of support from, from uh, school choice. We've been conservative in our use of school choice for the last couple of years. And so we have more uh, in our a revolving fund of school choice funds. And so we can go and be a little more aggressive with our spending in school choice this, this coming fiscal year, again, with the goal of not making any cuts to, to staffing or, or services that we, we provide to students. And so um, as far as sustainability of that level of funding, probably not at that high a level, but it'll be close to that level over the next several years. We have a healthy balance there. We have a good number of, of school choice students, uh, but you know we'll have to manage that. And 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 we're utilizing those funds much like we're using ESSER funds to help us as we transition to you know, having the sixth grade in uh, to the to the middle school, and and that'll uh, be an area where we can probably reduce uh, our use of of, of uh, school choice funds in the future. Uh, as far as ESSER funds and the FTE associated with that, uh, many of those staff are, are staff that have been brought on to uh, deal with particular items of concern relative to the pandemic. Uh, and so some of those staff are, are likely not to be needed as we transition through the, the pandemic and into its endemic phase. Um, so we're hopeful that, that some of that staffing will change and not be necessary as we move ahead. Um, so some of what you see with regard to that boost in, in staffing is, is some hires specifically to deal with pandemic related uh, needs of the, of the students. Um, at the same time, there's been a transition in schedule at the high school uh, to a block schedule. And so in working through you know, sort of what are the needs and demands of, of, of staffing for that schedule and, and preserving the elective structure that we'd like to have for students, uh, that's held steady. The, and uh, the number of staff that uh, are needed to provide all those courses. And so uh, I think that's part of what you're seeing as well, as far as the staffing uh, numbers sort of uh, holding steady or, or maybe even potentially increasing. Uh, as far as the sort of shift in spending uh, relative to you know, regular education versus uh, special education, uh, oftentimes with, with uh, and, and other parts of the budget, I mean, you know, uh, most of our software that we have uh, have gone onto schedules where they uh, increase their their software fee by 4% per year. Uh, insurance, uh, property insurance went up 10% this last year. Uh, so we have some inflationary pressure in some other areas of the budget uh, that you can't you know, sort of avoid. Uh, so they drive the budget by virtue of their need. Um, uh, you know, a lot of those areas that I just mentioned are not huge parts. I mean, software is a fairly significant component of our budget, but other areas are not as big, but there are several that have had that sort of increase that's above uh, you know, uh, it's two and a half percent or so that you can usually afford. Um, I think also when you talk to uh, the, the transition potentially from, you know, to more spending on special education, I think that's driven by the need of the students. And so uh, there's some, you know, there are uh, compulsory aspects of what we do in, in providing a free and appropriate public education to, to students. And so uh, that drives and those, those individualized education plans uh, drive some of the choices we have to make relative to staffing. Uh, to meet the needs of those students. And so that does sometimes increase our cost in that area. Um, and, and to be honest, over the last several years, we've had to make reductions. And, and you know, so those, those reductions are, are manifest in, in some of that re regular education spending uh, that has 
you know, we, we endeavor to make those cuts in ways that have the least impact on students, the least profound impact on students. And so uh, that's, you know, that's the process that we go through is to try to find ways to reduce in, in order to come with a balanced budget and stay within our, our financial uh, guidelines and resources in a way that, that has least impact on students and yet still preserves a lot of the things we're trying to do from a programmatic standpoint. <clears throat> um, there's one other point, Doug, I can remember that, uh, sorry. Um, well, Doug, I can um, jump in while you're thinking. Um, yeah. The last thing you want to say, I think uh, I think Mandy Joe's question, uh, we use first names in school committee, I hope that's okay for the counselors. Um, I've gotten into the habit of it. Um, they made a deliberate shift this past year to, to do that. Um, you know, I think there was three years ago that we saw a significant shift of students with special education needs that were serviced by paraeducators from the Amherst to the regional level. It was a very difficult year for the region and was actually probably the best year for the Amherst public schools. As a result, the number of paraeducators, the delta between the two districts was, I think, in the order of magnitude of six or seven. Um, so some of the, the staffing trends are reflected are cohorts of students who have had uh, some more significant adult support needed to access the curriculum than typical. And, and we saw a full swoop of them a couple of years ago. And because our districts uh, are organized the way they are, it was very visible uh, that one grade level went through. We're also are seeing an increase in, in parent referrals and have seen since school was closed and during the lockdown. And, and I think that's, that's a reality. I think the other thing, and I wanna acknowledge your point is we have decided uh, as a committee, as a community, to add staffing in areas uh, we the middle school and high school each have a restorative practices position um, that didn't exist before right and that doesn't come out under regular education it's like you know i forget the category but more like mental health support because uh, the community was asking it and i think that the council certainly can reflect uh, and probably relate to community um, feedback on areas similar areas uh, that you all are experiencing in the past you know year or two and I think the last thing I want to say, and I said this, you know, I'm not saying it to be flip, Mandy Joe, I said the same thing uh, at the council meeting is the school committee requested that we provide a level services budget for this year. So we provided a level service budget. And I think, um, I think you're rightly point out and has been talked about ad nauseum in, in uh, this district, but more in one of my other districts of late, uh, that this is not a sustainable path and that over time we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions. Uh, because right now we're, we're not operating. I'm not as worried about E&D and choice because uh, the number of choice students, if we want to take more choice students, we could. That's, you know, we have flexibility on that, but we don't have flexibility on ESSER lasting forever. So I think, I think to your point. Um, and, and I think that's feedback that, you know, certainly Doug and I can bring back to the school committee uh, at the regional level. Um, it's something we're aware of. Um, and, you know, at this level of ESSER funding support, um, you know, it feels a little more comfortable than one of my other districts. Uh, you know, and I think I've been pretty public about that. So I think you're right to note that the, the path of sustainability isn't quite clear at the moment. We do have some structural changes in terms of sixth grade moving up and some, some cost sharing with the Amherst Elementary School District and how that works. We also have some class sizes, grade level, grade levels that are quite smaller and about, you know, you look at fourth grade down, uh, you see a significant drop in enrollment. And so we do anticipate some efficiencies that can be realized once the students hit the region, but it's gonna be a couple of years till they hit the region. And, uh, you know, I think we're trying to figure out how to bridge that gap until we get there, until some of those other changes occur. So the other thing I was just going to add is, is relative to the change in enrollment for, for the regional school district. And really what we saw, and I think this has happened statewide, is uh, our enrollment in 18, 19, and 20, so fiscal years 18, 19, and 20, was, was basically flat within three or four kids of each other in each year. And then with fiscal 21 and 22, we've seen a significant drop. And of course, statewide, that's happened uh, with the pandemic, uh, a significant drop uh, you know, in, in enrollment. And, and it's just a little, uh, and so I think that that sort of, you know, when you compare your you know, five years ago versus now, it's, it wasn't a steady decline. It was sort of uh, level and then a shift, in, you know, sort of a, a step change in, in students. Uh, and, it, and it takes a bit for us to react and, and you know, absorb that kind of change and, and modify our staffing levels to to accommodate that. But but nonetheless, if our if our student levels stay lower like they are now, uh, you know, we'll we'll continue to you know refine and, and contract in some ways and and try to you know maintain our, our you know richness of programming that we have for students, but at the same time understand that you know we can't have uh, you know necessarily everything because we just don't have the number of students we've had in the past. Andy, do you have anything 
follow up or otherwise I'll go ahead and ask from Matt. Thank you, uh, Hey, good morning. Thanks, thanks, Andy. Um, this is great. I really want to echo uh, what, what Mandy Joe said about the um, giving us the full line item budget. We really appreciate that and thoughtful narrative and all the work that uh, went into it. Really, I mean, it's uh, above and beyond. I think what what I was expecting. So, just really grateful for that. Um, I guess I I had a couple quick points and then a, and then a question. Um, first of all, I just want to give you all a lot of credit, Mike, on the um, on the programmatic side. Uh, you know, seeing the the sped tuition revenues going up the way that they are really reflects such an incredible amount of work uh, on your on your part, on the staff's part. Um, you know, that's a real difference maker when it comes to regional school districts, and it, it's also a you know it's also a major um, uh, expense suppressant because I mean, I mean if we have programs available then. A lot of the, you know, uh, a lot of the uncertainty that comes from new sped tuitions really it helps us control for that a little bit. Um, so I just, I just give you guys a lot of credit for for all the hard work you've done on that front. Um, and of course, you know, uh, that also connects to what um, what was said about the uh, the special ed staffing. So I, I do notice, you know, that the numbers have gone up um, on on that staffing, and I was. Just looking at our state profile, you know, we we are um, for for our student percentages, we're we're higher than you know than our neighbors would be for our um, for our special education population, and we're we're lower than the state rates for our economically disadvantaged. So we're kind of an outlier when it comes to high incidence of special education um, rates, you know, which is which is just just kind of a fact of life. But I think you know I notice a few more psychologists added to that. To that uh, budget, and you know, things like that are really are necessary and and can be um, cost containers in the long run. So you know, and also they're hard to find. As we you know, we were talking about the Crest program uh, a couple months ago. I mean, that's that's not an easy staffing position to fill, and and having one um, in the long run is is a much it, it's a good investment. I would I would say. Um, so I, I give you all a lot of credit for this. You know, I do I do share some of the the concerns around. Um, you know, how ESSER bridges versus, you know, boosts that level. But I, you know, I think nobody, nobody in this call is, is unaware of some of those challenges coming up. Um, and the only question I have is maybe a little sort of in the weeds, as they say, but uh, I noticed that we had a Medicaid expansion uh, reference early on, you know, to the IEP students. I'm sorry, Medicaid reimbursement reference to the IEP students. And mm -hmm. I know Doug and my, I'm sure y'all are familiar, but um, Medicaid expanded a few years and particularly for districts where we do have a lot of clinical services, um, you know, any student who, who has uh, services from eligible providers is eligible for a Medicaid reimbursement. And I'm just wondering if that is something that y'all just hadn't updated in the narrative in the opening, or if we're not pursuing the Medicaid expansion funds, because depending on, on your, where you work, that can be a pretty significant, um, chunk of reimbursement. I would suggest the narrative hasn't been updated. I can almost guarantee that I didn't review that as closely and, and put that in there. But nonetheless, uh, you know, we certainly pursue any and all Medicaid dollars that we can. Um, you know, and, and if you look at sort of recent history of Medicaid, you know, reimbursements have gone down. Mm -hmm. Part of that was just the pandemic. We weren't physically in spaces with kids to do those services in a lot of ways. And so our eligible costs that we could get reimbursed for were a lot lower in the last couple of years. Those are returning to you know, pre-pandemic levels with being in school all year, um, but I think I'm, I probably failed to update the, the nuance of the of the uh, of the narrative in the in the in the book. So I'll take that and, and try to make that correction. Thank you. Okay, great. Anything else, Matt? I I do want to ask a question. Uh, whoever signed on about 10 or 15 minutes ago um, using Lynn's sign-in and has just the uh, P on the screen, it would be helpful to, uh, okay, uh, thank you, um, because uh, we, need to, we need to know who that was for the uh, sake of uh, the minutes, uh, uh, since Sean is keeping the minutes, he is, is to know who who's here so thank you very much 
And if you want to change your name on the screen, you can do so. And uh, in any event, uh, we're, what we're doing now is continuing with questions just in order um, of all present. Uh, Dorothy, I think you're next. Yes. Hi. And I'm, I'm in my car because the cleaning lady is in the house. And uh, that's the only way I can do the meeting right now. Um, I just wanted to speak up for uh, regular education, which is does not have as uh, strict rules as special education. Um, I, I guess I was a little perturbed at the example of the school nurse uh, cost saving with a larger group. I just want to remind you that regular students at this time are, I'm sure, increasingly acting up, up and there's a lot of silent suffering. Mm -hmm. And school nurses are the place that many students just go all the time just for solace even when they're not sick they just go to sit in the nurse's office to calm down a little bit and i um am i, I understand the budget tightness and all of the, the things but i i'm hoping that more um counselors therapy nurses and whatever will be available to the regular ed students because they need it so thank you I can respond to that just briefly. Uh, and I'm sorry, I should clarify the comment with the nurses. We're not looking to reduce nurses. It's just, the, well, the same number of students next year uh, or a year and a half from now, they'll just be structured differently. And that'll happen again two years after. So it's it's really about cost sharing between the districts. It wasn't a, a reduction of nurses. And as, as Matt indicated, we've increased our mental health support that's accessible to all students, not just special education students. And I think the last thing that to note is that, you know, the change in the high school schedule to the block does create some efficiencies. Um, and so there are class sizes remaining very, very comparable or better than comparable to neighboring districts at the secondary level uh, and at the high school, which I'm speaking about specifically, uh, the change to the block schedule allowed for students to spend more of their day in class, uh, which is a good thing. There's less passing periods and uh, passing periods are the bane of many school administrators' uh, ex experiences, but also it's lost learning time. Uh, and actually, because of the way the schedule functions, allows us to even out class size in a way where our class size is better than it was two years ago. Uh, at the high school level, uh, and that's not with adding staff. Um, that's just more efficient use of staffing. So I, I do want to note that, you know, Mandy Joe's point is absolutely well taken, uh, but at the same time, we're not seeing classes of 35 or, you know, we, our, our average class size is, is in the low 20s. Uh, we provided a report for the regional school committee in the fall that detailed that uh, by class, by, uh, by individual class, as well as by uh, content area. So um, I don't want anyone leaving the meeting feeling like all the class sizes are, are full at 32 students. That, that's not our high school. That's not our secondary school system. Um, you know, we've been able to realize some efficiencies over time, both by change in schedule and reduction in student enrollment. Um, but we retain very low class size, which is important for all of our students, our regular ed and special education students. Thank you. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for the detailed budget. Um, it actually was available, we just didn't post it. And, uh, but we were able to find it with Doug's help and send it out. Um, this may be a fairly complicated question. So let me preface it by saying, um, you were able to demonstrate during the discussion of the program for the new elementary school a serious change in how you deal with special ed. And that that has led to the ability to keep more special ed students in district than rather than send them out. Personally, I wanna thank you for that, being the parent of a special ed student, putting a most vulnerable kid on a bus to go an hour away is not my idea of a good time or a good decision. So, have you taken that model to the high school? And does that model in the high school therefore reflect in some of the increased special ed costs? So that's one question. And then I wanna be very careful not to suggest that I wanna signal out special ed because I think signaling out special ed is has many, many um, downsides. But when you provide us with staffings and student and budget trends. Could you in fact also provide us with 
trends regarding special ed students and indicate in those budgets when you began to expand to the more in-district services that you now provide than what you would then otherwise. And again, I want to be really clear. This is not to suggest we shouldn't be doing this. It's not to try to tell you how to run your schools. It is to try to help understand what some of the impacts are on our budget. So thank you. I can do the first part and I'll turn to Doug for the second part. So to answer your question, yes, we have built out our programs in special education at the middle school and high school level as well. Uh, we have um, much less significant, it, it, it's funny with the state data because when you compare it, you know, we have a split district, most districts, and we're no different, see a higher percentage of out of district placements at the secondary level than the elementary level, just because the nature of secondary students, it's harder to engage uh, depending on um, students' uh, needs uh, in a high school schedule of courses than it is in second grade. Um, you know, just the, the inclusion opportunities are a little more present. So. That said, we have a robust set of specialized programs. We spent a fair, fair bit of uh, funds a couple of years ago to reform and improve our uh, program for our most disabled students at the high school with some uh, infrastructure improvements at the space, as well as staffing pieces along with it. So to answer your question, absolutely. Um, and more recently, especially in our ninth grade programs, a little bit in our 10th grade programs, we've worked on a uh, co-teaching inclusion model uh, that's been very, very successful at the at that grade level once you get to the elective programs 11th and 12th grade you know so the management of that becomes a little more challenge but at the core core courses uh, we're doing incredible amount more inclusion than we were five six years ago and that's good thanks to good work of uh, talib mickey gramaki at the high school sam camera but also Faye brady our student services director um so uh and i want to be honest that we have more students who who go out of district and and that's the nature of secondary schools um we're still well below the mean if you, if you look at secondary schools and you can access some of this data, not all, but some of the state website, they don't, they're not designed for uh, multiple districts sharing a central office the way that, that uh, you and many other districts in Western Mass have set it up, um, but well below the mean on that uh, if you look across the state. I'll let Doug jump in on kind of how that's reflected in the budget documents, uh, but I really appreciate the, the, um, the question and the framing. Uh, the only thing I'll add is that, you know, we certainly can put together, you know, as I put together the sort of request from earlier, I'll, I'll, I can add in some of the uh, some of the requests relative to trends in special ed education students. I think one of the tricky things there is we want to make sure not to, you know, identify anybody uh, in, in that process, uh, you know, as you start to, to get into the, some of those things. The numbers start to get small, they start to get identifiable. We'll definitely avoid that in, in that regard. Um, but certainly, you know, identifying what those trends have been like uh, and, and what kind of programming we've done and whether we sort of implemented certain aspects of, of programming over the over the recent years. Um, I, I'll just echo what the superintendent said, and that is the number of students we have, although more in our secondary versus our elementary uh, that are in out-of-district placements, the number we have relative to many other districts is, is considerably lower. Um, and so it's, it's uh, you know, those, those programs, I would suggest, are, are very cost effective for us. So can I do a follow on, Andy? Sure. OK, I also want to add that this is not in any way to diminish the regular program. Um, when you do the comparison, is, is there any way to look at if you had to send those students out of district, what it would cost? compared to keeping those students, I don't mean the ones you're already sending out, but I mean the ones that probably you're now able to accommodate that you weren't able to accommodate six years ago. Okay, that's a little bit of comparison because somebody might say, well, you know, if it means an extra teacher, then why not pay the tuition going out? The second question is in, when you do tuitioning in, clearly Amherst is a very attractive district to tuition in if you're special ed. Do you get more money for that? And should you get more money for that? And what should we be doing about that? So I'll, I'll answer that in, in some, uh, I think as far as you know, comparing sort of kids that are retained in district versus being sent out of district, uh, it, it will be imperfect, but nonetheless, I think we can make that kind of a comparison just to sort of see what that what that delta is between those two. 
Um, it's it's you know not sort of cut and dry. You know, these kids would, these kids would. You know, it's 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 a bit variable in that regard. Um, regarding the tuition in question, yeah, we have a you know we have a couple of programs uh, that that do take students from other districts. Um, you know, as far as you know, sort of setting a price, we do charge those districts. It's not you know it's not the uh, the uh, school choice sort of five thousand dollars kind of thing. It's uh, we 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 you know go through the process of uh, determining what our program costs and administrative costs. Um, you know, we have to stay competitive in some respects. I mean, it sounds weird. It's sort of like, you know, thinking in terms of a profit center, but it's not really um, what we're looking to do is try to cover costs that we would incur if, if the students comes to our, our program. Uh, so we do factor those things in and, and, uh, and reevaluate and, and assess those, those towns uh, based on, on what we need to cover our, our costs. There is some, of course, economy of scale we get sometimes when we, when we bring another student in. So that's helpful to our district in that regard. Um, but it's, it's really about, you know, I, I think if you, if you spoke to some of our program leaders in the, you know, it's about finding the right match for the student and getting them the best education they can. And, uh, that's really the sort of primary focus and the, the fact that we can uh, offset those costs with tuition is just, you know, to sort of make sure that, that, that home district and our district are, are kind of, uh, holding our own and, 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 uh, covering the costs that we're responsible for. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, actually, I'm going to uh, vary the order uh, because we have a couple of people who've asked to be recognized second time with Bernie Kubiak. Uh, uh, you haven't spoken yet and asked any questions, so I'll recognize Bernie next. Thanks, thanks Andy. And um, I, I do want to congratulate. Um, and thank uh, Mike and Doug and for, and they're in a difficult position. They're they're stuck between um, multiple committees, <laughs> and uh, uh, they've got to man maneuver through all that. And I really appreciate their collaborative approach to this, uh, rather than a, a combative approach. And uh, it's really refreshing given uh, my experience with other school districts. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, I, you know, I'm a long history of working with special needs folks, and the question I have is, is in terms of state reimbursement. I know there's a threshold. I know that threshold varies, and I'm wondering if that, uh, what that threshold is, and how much uh, reimbursement we can expect in future years, because this is always backward looking for our, our special ed efforts right now. And the second question I have this morning uh, was announced that CPI. Um, inflation on the consumer price index is like 8.4%. Uh, Doug, you touched very briefly on inflation's impact, but there are other, um, inflation tends to hit governments a little harder, government operations a little harder because of the way services are, 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 are purchased. And I'd, I'd like you to expand just a little bit more on your comments on inflation impact on the budget. Thank you. Sure, so I can, uh, you know, take that, Last question first, I think a little bit, you know, uh, we try to anticipate uh, and we get some information from some of our vendors relative to, to the, uh, you know, cost increases that they're seeing or they're anticipating for us. And so we try to factor that into our budgets when and where we can. Obviously, unexpected cost increase, uh, unexpected cost increases are obviously very, very difficult to deal with. Uh, and so, you know, that's where, uh, you know, our sort of management of the budget during the year, and I think this coming year is going to be fairly difficult in that regard, is, is going to be uh, tricky because, you know, there's just going to be some costs uh, that are, you know, higher and significantly higher in some areas uh, than they've been, they've been in the past and, and will you know, sort of outstrip what we budgeted. And so we'll have to sort of conserve in some other areas to, to, to meet the, the need and, and to cover the costs. <clears throat> So in that regard, you know, it, it, it's quite difficult. It will be difficult uh, in this, you know, sort of anytime the, the, the you know, the, the, uh, the cost increases are happening rapidly, they're much harder to, to accommodate. Uh, you know, price decreases, which don't have been off, but, you know, are welcome and, and much easier to deal with. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, it's gonna, it, it, if inflation continues on the track, it has been over the last several months in particular, uh, it's, it will prove to be a, a challenging year to manage the budget as we, as we go ahead. Um, to your question about, um, uh, oh, shoot, 
cost of trade. Agency cost reimbursement for expenses. Oh, the reimbursement, yes. So the, the current threshold for, for that, it's called the circuit breaker program in special education. Uh, the current threshold is is in the about $45,000 range. So we have to spend about $45,000 before any money is eligible for reimbursement. Once you get above that threshold, then uh, the state reimburses uh, at a percentage of those costs. So uh, they try to reimburse uh, the special education costs at about 75%. Uh, in the last couple of years, they've added transportation costs as eligible costs as well. Uh, so once they've reimbursed 75% of those eligible special education costs, then 25% of the uh, transportation costs are, are eligible for reimbursement. Uh, and they're going to work you know, towards higher levels of reimbursement on those is, is the goal. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you have to have incur in-house a, a fairly significant level of expense before you can begin to, uh, to uh, have eligible costs. Year over year, I mean, it varies depending on the number of students that, that sort of hit that threshold for us. Uh, but year over year in the regional schools, that amount of money is in the, um, you know, six to $800,000 range. Um, it, you know, and it, it's a lagging indicator because we do the, we do the work in one year, they reimburse us the next, we budget it the following year. Um, uh, so, you know, and, and as student population in that, you know, the, in that category of, of extraordinary expense uh, changes, then, the, then those numbers go up and down. We try to uh, leverage those funds in a, in a coherent way and, and budget for them accordingly and help reduce our, our uh, you know, sort of future costs based on our past uh, efforts. Um, but it's, it's a pretty you know, significant, uh, you know, support to the budget. And, you know, obviously if, if the state were to, uh, to fund that reimbursement at a higher level, it'd be very, very beneficial for ourselves and, and pretty much every other district in the, in the Commonwealth. Um, Kathy. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, I have a question, um, based on just seeing something in the newspaper, but that we have this new Crest program that we've opened up in the town. And it looks like it was helpful to bring in the current director, the recently hired director into the high school. Do you see when ESSER funds run out, I think one of the things you said is that you were staffing up during this time period as people came back because of a uh, pandemic impact. Is Will that program potentially be of use to the regional school system? I, I said and or uh, local. So it's it's a it's sort of a question looking into the future because it is uh, staffing. Well, you know what it is: is staffing with mediation, with mental health skills, with talking with people, restorative justice. Kind, you know, trying to work through um, conflict. So it's uh, is there any synergy with that program? Is my question. Yeah, I think uh, I think Earl would be best to answer that question, but I can share that I, you know, I did have a meeting two weeks ago, perhaps with 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 Earl, the director, and with Talib uh, at the high school, and there was another one, uh, one of Earl's colleagues as well. Um, I think the way what I heard and what we know is that. Uh, oftentimes the challenges we see in school are, are integrally connected with the challenges that are existing in the community. So from his perspective, and I share that, um, if you're going to address one, you sort of have to address the other, right? And I think even, I think it was interviewed, I'm not sure what made it into the paper today, uh, about some of the challenges a few weeks ago at the high school is, you know, I think the days of when many of us were in high school or in school and conflicts actually originated in school, that, that's, that's thing that never happens, but it pretty rarely happens. It's, it's really challenges that existing in the community and online community coming into school. And that's what we see on a more regular basis. And so um, I hope that we're able to maintain the level of dialogue that we've started. Uh, I found uh, just a boots in the ground, let, let, let me show up, let me see what meet kids. And uh, I think there was a real commitment also about um, training uh, anyone in the community, but including our inclusive of our, our middle school and high school students on active bystander work, uh, of anti-racism work. And that really connects to a lot of the work we're doing in the district with a different lens. And, you know, frankly, many of the high schools in the United States, I would say most maintain public safety officer in our schools. Our, our regional school committee has never allowed for that, or at least not in the last 25 years. I can't go back that far. Uh, or further than that, 
And uh, we have a good relationship with the Amherst Police Department. I don't want to suggest that we don't, but we don't have a regular presence. Um, and, and so uh, this is a different opportunity for us uh, to think through. And I just appreciate Talib and, and Earl's willingness to engage, Earl's willingness to you know, be present and make some relationships with students. And you know, what we say is they're often the same relationships that would need to be formed within our communities. Uh, just we have a captive audience in school, right? Um, less captive audience in the community. And so I think it's in everyone's best interest that we're making those connections and building those bridges uh, between Crest and the schools and the community and, and just really happy to have partners who are eager and excited to be working together on it. Okay, uh, Sean, you had your hand up and I didn't know if you were... Yeah, I was only gonna say that we should think about moving to Capitol um, pretty soon, only because yeah, we have Amy uh, and Guilford in the audience. Um, for the for the next agenda item so yeah no i was thinking about that too i want to uh, wrap this uh section up up i have a couple of counselors who are still have questions and i may or may not ask one um, afterwards but uh we we do need to move along to uh capital um but mandy yeah. Actually, that was part of my questions, which is I have a lot of questions that don't necessarily relate to the operating budget. They're more revolving fund questions or use of revolving funds and things like that. Um, how should I email Andy to forward them on to get answers? Where where do I send those questions? Uh, because they're not directly related to operating. So that's my first question. And then I guess I wanted to follow up on my other question about um, just the level, the portion of the budget dedicated to any particular area. You know, there are certain things, as, as Doug said, that are non-discretionary spending that just go up. Health insurance, we can't do anything about it, right? Um, you know, transportation costs, you have a contract, you can't do anything about it. And by state law, you have to provide something. But by state law, you have to provide a free and appropriate education for all students, not just special education students. And so I am concerned that as those non-discretionary spending increases and pushes, puts pressure on the whole budget, that the, the decision is being made to cut reg regular education, but not cut special education. And that, that that pressure on the budget is being felt unequally between um, the students in regular education and the students in special education. So that was that was where I was trying to go with the question as to why are we spending less in real dollar in actual dollars, not even real dollars, um, this year than five years ago. Because I fear we're we're the the regular education students and that part of the program is taking the brunt of the pressure that. All budgets, you know, especially in this inflationary period, all budgets are going to face massive pressure um, when you decide where to to put that money. And so, so that I, I just have a concern about that 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 it's being taken and and you know the brunt of that pressure is being experienced on the regular education side than the special education side. And I don't know whether that's true, but in looking at the budget, that's that's somewhat of potentially what I see. Um, just a, a quick response to that um, concern. Um, so we have not cut regular education in the budget. We're not cut any positions uh, this year. Uh, a couple years ago, we did have some shifts. We also uh, a cut that's it's hard to realize in a budget book as we move Summit Academy from the old building into the high school. There's, uh, I think the reason it's hard to realize is that that reduction was about was six digits. Uh, and it, it repeats every year. In other words, if we hadn't made that shift, uh, we would still have a lot of staffing that we don't currently need. So you don't show that every year, but the reality is it was a structural change. I think my, uh, and it, this is gonna sound nitpicky, I suppose, but when students have IEPs and they talk about services, you know, I don't view that as discretionary, right? It's not like I can say, no, we're gonna cut the budget, therefore you're no longer gonna get math special education services. That's not in the discretionary part of what Doug or myself are able to do. And I think the challenge of special ed is, right, that happens in IEP meetings um, that occur every day throughout the school year. And those decisions are made by team meetings as defined by the state. And so uh, I definitely get the larger point, but I think when we look at discretionary spending, uh, we rarely have a lot of flexibility within special education because it's based on IEPs 
uh, that are signed and formed by a team as per you know the state protocol. And so I think that's one of the reasons you're not seeing a lot of cuts in special education is that you know most of the costs related to special education um, are not discretionary. Um, so, uh, but I don't I don't mean to pick on the word you use, but I think it is just a useful distinction because uh, it's our reality. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't see any hands up at the moment. I know that uh, Jennifer, you had your hand up, but it then took time again. So, uh, you okay, or do you have something? No, I I can email in my question. Okay, so uh, thank you for saying that because that was how I was going to conclude this. Mandy raised the same question, which is, if you have questions that. Um, you think of that you'd like to pose later. If it's okay with uh, Mike and Doug, what I would suggest is that um, we uh, try and assemble any additional questions and uh, forward them so that we don't prolong this morning. Uh, and uh, if you could email them to me, I will share them with, uh, Lynn and Sean, and uh, we will try and put the questions together um, if there are additional questions and forward them. And uh, it would be helpful uh, to set a deadline um, in maybe um, a week from today might be the best uh, way for um, if you have additional questions so that we have time to uh, then do something and get them along during the uh, vacation week, Lynn? Yeah, I just want to make sure that as you compile questions and we get answers, those answers would be made available to all counselors and to the public. Yes, uh, I think we should uh, make it clear that anything that comes in in the way of questions and answers would need to uh, uh, be public accessible information because this is part of a meeting of the whole. So with that, um, let's uh, try and get on to the uh, capital questions. And I don't know if uh, either uh, Mike or Doug want to say anything initially about the capital before we open that up to, to questions. Doug? Yeah, I think I just want to be clear about the, the pieces of the puzzle we have here. So there's the capital assessment, which is shown in this slide, right? The right one here and here, and particularly the line right there, uh, 388, 331. That's for debt that has already been issued, capital projects that have been approved and are either uh, in process or completed, and we borrowed the money uh, in order to, uh, uh, to accomplish those. And so that's part of the budget. That's... Uh, you know, an assessment that, that will be paying debt that is already incurred. Um, what you see in the upper part of this screen is the new debt authorization that we are asking for to do capital projects. There's about $160,000 of sort of standard or classic uh, uh, you know, uh, capital projects. And then there's the, the fields and track project. And we did those authors, the school committee did those authorizations in sort of two steps. And part of that's because uh, the, the 160,000 is sort of the standard uh, authorization we asked for and, and the standard process and kind of programs that we asked for. And so that's one. Uh, because the nature of the track project is a little more complex, that authorization was done separately and it has sort of two pieces to it. But the key thing to keep in mind, I think, is that uh, it's an authorization for $1.5 million in borrowing for a track project. There are two sort of flavors of that. Uh, there's, you know, uh, and either are options that are available. There's no decisions that's been made yet relative to which ones it, it is dependent, but that language that we use for that authorization that the school committee did allows for the exploration of, of uh, different options relative to uh, how to execute on, on the need there. Um, you know, the critical piece and is that the track as it currently exists is, is becoming un, you know, unusable, it's not able to host um, host track meets, uh, home track meets, it's becoming more and more difficult to be usable for PE classes as well as uh, even practice for track. Uh, so there's need to, to take action relative to that. Uh, and of course, 
in a larger scheme, it would be uh, advantageous to rotate its orientation so that the interior field is facing a north-south direction, which is a much more playable circumstance and, and creates a much better uh, utilization of the fields and space around the school. Um, but nonetheless, the, the critical question that we're asking is, is for the authorization to borrow in order to do uh, a project, which project will, will play out over time. So I think I'll stop there and let you guys sort of pose what other questions you might have, but I wanted to draw the distinction between the assessment that we need uh, authorization for, which is a budgetary thing, and it's the payment of, of sort of uh, debts owed and, and will be coming due, and then the authorizations, which is for new borrowing for uh, future projects and, and, and needs. Hey, Sean, did you? Wanna... Yeah, I'll just add that um, there was a request at the when at the presentation to the council. We had combined these into one financial order. Um, there was a request to separate the track and field from the other projects, and um, Sonia has gone ahead and done that. So, for the hearing um, and the subsequent finance committee meeting, we'll have we'll provide you with the two separate capital orders or two separate debt authorizations. Um, for one for the track and field and then one for everything else. And the plan for the track and field is that you're seeking additional donations and other funding uh, to see if, uh, so that to build on the base amount and do the larger project. And uh, are you uh, planning to uh, approach Amherst CPA committee and other CPA committees to uh, as a part of that effort? So the, yes, is the short answer. Um, so we're uh, obviously if we can, uh, you know, leverage CPA from each of the communities, we'll go back to the Amherst CPA. Uh, I'm scheduled to go to the Pelham CPA meeting. Uh, the the Leverage Tewsbury CPA meet on a different cycle. I'll probably engage with them as I engage with their with their community uh, about other levels of funding they might be able to provide from other sources, whether it be uh, CPA funds, ARPA funds, uh, reserves, whatever other mechanisms they might have uh, to help support this project. Um, so we'll be working with each of the four towns to find those other resources that sit sort of external to the traditional regional assessment method. Um, but would be necessary in, a, in order to do a larger, a larger project. And, and so uh, that's a, a bit of work that's in process and, and we're, we're, we're definitely reaching out to any and all sort of sources and, and uh, each of the four communities. Okay, uh, we go to uh, counselor questions on the capital and then if you need to come back for explanation, but Dorothy? Um, <clears throat> I would like to suggest a slightly different um, angle on the fundraising effort for the track. Instead of going to community sources, which are contested for other causes, I think this is a great naming opportunity for somebody with a lot of money to um, pay for most of it. Just, I mean, really the big bucks because some people are not happy with the fancy track being competing for CPA money with other causes. And yet there are other people who'd love to have the track named after them. So I'm wondering if you're looking at the really the big donors as well as the usual donors. I think the short answer is, yeah, we absolutely uh, are, are looking at those types of things. Um, you know, conversations we've had today with, with some of the you know uh, fundraisers that have been looking at those types of things, those kind of options, uh, whether they be a larger single donor or, or multiple large donors, uh, you know, certainly uh, avenues of exploration that are currently going on, and, and you know we're we're happy to to uh, entertain any and all of those options and those ideas, and and uh, you know likewise we would look at you know there are the traditionally national organizations that provide grants. Um, mm -hmm. That a few years ago with the tennis courts here at the middle school, the USTA we had a fairly, uh, you know, a significant uh, grant program and put very little, very modest limitations on us. If we can find similar ones like that, we'll use those as well. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll uh, definitely seek those kinds of opportunities. Okay. Well, thank you. So just think big. That's all. Mandy. 
Thank you. Um, a couple of questions that the debt schedule that's on the screen right now that was in the presentation is different in numbers than the debt schedule on page 164 of the budget. And I know some of it's because there's a lot of projected debt in the other one. Um, but so the question is the one on the screen doesn't actually include the borrowing for the one and a half million for the track project, I think, if I'm looking at it. Question on the page 164's debt budget projection says it includes this, the track borrowing at various levels, but I couldn't find it as separately set out. So that's just a, am, am I missing it somewhere? Um, where is it included? Um, the 10 year budget has window and door replacements at $10 million at the high school with the roof being only $5 million. Um, I'm having trouble understanding how the roof is, uh, how windows and doors cost double the amount of the roof. Um, so, so that that would be helpful for, for me. And then the debt schedule on 164 stops with projections at FY27, it says, which means the roof in FY28, um, the windows in FY30 aren't even on this debt projection schedule. Um, and so one of my big questions is, these numbers get big, not just for Amherst, but for Pelham, for Leverett, for Shutesbury um, in this 10 year plan and don't even include um, a 17 million in borrowing starting in FY28 and FY30. Is it even possible for not just Amherst, but Pelham, Shutesbury, and Leverett to pay the assessments if all of this would happen, um, such that is this even a logical plan? And then as it relates to the track, I'm having a lot of um, a concern or struggle with the fact that we are being asked to authorize borrowing for a project we don't know which one we'll be going for. So the question I have is, you know, because to me, a project for just replacing the track is much different than reorienting doing a grass turf field that will allow a lot more heavy use on the fields and all of that. And, and I have different thoughts about them. And so why are we being asked to authorize the borrowing before all of the fundraising has been done and we can be told exactly which project is being done? Why do we need to authorize the borrowing now? Why did the school committee go forward with that instead of figure out whether they could raise the money and then come back with, this is the project we're doing? So uh, taking a few of those in, in different order. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the the uh, previous slide that was up that that showed uh, the sort of you know the the, uh, the debt over the over the coming years uh, does include one and a half million in borrowing. Uh, it doesn't hit the budget until fiscal twenty four. Um, so the borrowing happens in twenty three. The, the actual first payment doesn't hit until twenty four. Uh, it includes the roof project at the middle school, uh, which which comes online that same year. Um, I think the, uh, the the difficulty in what needs to happen relative to this, and I haven't had the opportunity to do that, is to balance out the, the sort of debt over, over time. It does get to be a bit uh, overwhelming. We've heard that from the other four, you know, the other three communities as well. It's it's a pretty high spike in the in the coming years. Uh, relative to those two larger projects, the high school, the roof, and the, and the windows and doors, I'll, I'll say this, in both circumstances, we apply for MSBA uh, programs like we, do, we have been for the, for the uh, middle school roof. It's likely that that will push out how far into the future those will be, uh, and they will provide some support relative to reducing that cost um, in, in the current sort of projection, you know, we're taking on the full cost. Uh, just as an example, you know, the, the windows and door project uh, here at the middle school, I think was on the order of close to $6 million. Uh, and the estimates for the roof on this building are, are in the sort of uh, $3 million range. And so, you know, there's, there's roughly that double it, windows and doors, are you know, for whatever reason, I think it's, a, they're fairly expensive. And they're also, you know, a lot more uh, uh, labors involved in getting them installed and, and that sort of thing. So that's why the, the scale of, of what you see at the high school, it's a much larger physical uh, building and, and a lot more windows and doors um, to be to be replaced potentially there. But in both those cases, they're they're uh, very broad and rough estimates at this point. I think they're also likely to get pushed further out into the future. Um, and the, and there are other projects within that capital plan that will get adjusted depending upon when uh, some larger projects come online or don't come online. So uh, we have some you know some larger uh, you know paving projects and that sort of thing that we'll do probably in smaller chunks and also potentially depending on when say the roof would get the 
USDA reimbursement uh, support, uh, you know, would, would impact when, when that happens. Um, so again, on what's showing here, uh, you know, there's a slight adjustment to, you know, fiscal 23 that went down a little bit by virtue of some uh, refinement of, of some numbers and, and, and uh, some higher paying off of, of, uh, of principal. And so the amount of debt that, that we have uh, is a little bit less. <clears throat> as far as the out years, uh, you know, as currently, you know, sort of structured, yes, this is a pretty aggressive and, and expensive plan and will, will necessarily uh, require some fine tuning to be able to be affordable by the, the communities. Amherst and the other three. Uh, so I recognize that and, and we'll need to refine that as we move ahead and, and get a little more specifics about the, the different things. Uh, as far as the authorization, uh, you know, the debt authorization and the request for the, the, the uh, authorization at this point in time, um, <clears throat> regional school committee can, can authorize debt at any point in time, but they have it in, in a 60 day sort of clock starts relative to each town's ability to accept or reject that. Uh, if they take no action, it's a pocket approval. Uh, and traditionally, anytime we've asked for borrowing from the four communities, we do it on cycle. And so uh, you know, there's not typically or not always a fall town meetings. So we traditionally do our debt authorization uh, such that it hits all the spring town meetings and gives every town an opportunity to weigh in whether they're okay or not okay with that authorization. Uh, so that's part of why it's coming for you at this point in time. Uh, the second thing is that you know, the track needs a replacement now. I mean, that's a short story um, and it, it really cannot wait. And, and so, uh, well, I think everyone is hopeful uh, to do a, a larger, more comprehensive project. Uh, the reality is, is that track needs to be replaced sooner than later. And what this does uh, by having authorization now is, uh, and having it structured the way it is now, where it can be either just replacement in place or uh, a larger project gives a fixed time horizon uh, for us to uh, coordinate and, and uh, fundraise around those other sources of funds. And so I think that gives us a clear trajectory of timeline for, uh, for everyone to, to meet that need and, and try to uh, raise those funds. Uh, we've, we've been kind of pushing off, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, approaching this project and this problem because of the difficulty of that fundraising and knowing the need for it. And, and it's been something that we just can't delay any longer. And so that's why the authorization is in front of you now. And, and it does set a timeline that, that uh, will require us to sort of you know step up and make meet those needs both from you know, uh, the communities and and their commitments uh, separate from the regional agreement assessments, uh, but also then in, in fundraising. So I think that's uh, a couple of the reasons why you see that uh, in front of you and in the form that it has at the current time. If I could jump in just briefly, two things. One is that unfortunately I'm going to have to depart. Um, I think Doug can stay a little later than me, but um, Capital is a good, a good, good one for Doug to take the lead on because he's much more knowledgeable. But I think I just want to add to to what Doug said there uh, in response to the question about why the track and 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 so I want to be unequivocal that I think it's in the best interest of the region and the community that we do the larger project. You know, for all the reasons that you said, Mandy Joe, right? You know, the turf field would. Talking to other superintendents, being in other communities, um, it transforms not just the athletic program, but the year round use. I mean, the way um, facilities are built now, you can build a turf field that, that it's truly year round, that, that can be plowed, can be, can be uh, you know, even the cold winter days. We have kids in, and walk, I work in a middle school, right? I see kids and how they dress despite the weather. And if there was a field for them to play on, they would play on that field despite being 38 degrees. And we don't have that capability. Uh, and not just our students, but our, our larger community. So I think as a district, and, and I think the school committee was, I think I, I don't wanna speak for them, but I was very supportive of that effort. And we have questions about, you know, whether we can pull that off given other, you know, with all four towns. And so the reason just to be blunt about it, it's in there is the track needs to be replaced because it's not safe for kids. It's becoming not safe, not just for meets, but for practices. We have a lot of concerns from coaches um, around that. It needs to happen one way or the other. And so what we didn't want to do was set up a high stakes scenario where uh, if the larger project didn't happen, that we would be back to the drawing board because we've, we've been in this place for longer than I've been superintendent with this exact problem. And we, we need to move the track. It's, it's not something that can wait any longer. And uh, much like you, I see the, the huge benefits that would, would come from the larger project and uh, totally am on board and I'll be out there singing the praises of why and I've done that at public meetings and, and, and we'll continue to do that. And I wanna thank Dave Zolmek and town staff who have also been integral partners in this. I don't want anyone to leave this meeting feeling like this is only a district 
uh, thing or only district uh, employees have been involved. Dave and others from the town have been, been heavily involved in these discussions. Um, and, and Dave obviously knows this for many, many years. So I just wanted to add those points. I do apologize that I do have, um, I'm now uh, um, 15, 16 minutes late for a meeting I need to I need to be at. So I do apologize, but Doug, are you okay to stay a bit longer? Cause I see there's other hands up on the capital pieces. Yes, I am. All right, thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. So Mike, thank you very much for uh, having been with us this morning. We really appreciated uh, your uh, very openness to responding to questions and uh, uh, we uh, realized that the track and the um, entire field is an important priority. Uh, and uh, we're just trying to understand how the, to um, manage it and really admire your creativity in doing that. So thank you, Mike. Um, I'm gonna continue on with uh, Andy, Andy, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, uh, Sean. Andy, I was going to say, just given the process. given the hour, we might want to switch over to water and uh, sewer regulations and take um, any remaining questions either through email or we are going to have another meeting where we can devote um, a bunch of time to this topic. But we're at 1030 and I know Amy and Guilford are still with us. I'm happy to come back too, if you need me to. Okay, um, let me just see if there's... Um... Is there anyone, um, leave your hand up if you have a question about capital that you feel needs to be asked now and need a response now, as opposed to um, submitting them in writing to be grouped as we talked about. And if, uh, let's see what they are that are left then. Kathy and Lynn. Uh, let me just do it in timing. So when is the next, do we have time to have Doug come back? Um, I'm happy to hold my question and send it. Um, it's about it's about the interaction with Sean's five-year cap and Paul's five-year capital plan. And, you know, where's the money going to come from? But I, I can send my very specific questions in on both. So I'm just, so would that be the, the next... I don't want this 60 day, I don't like the idea of these 60 day uh, time limit, uh, ticking, the clock ticking. So do we have time to do this at the next meeting? So the 26th, uh, this is supposed yeah. to be a major agenda item. So the answer is yes, correct? Okay, yeah, I then don't I know. Um, let's ask Doug, uh, uh, this question for you, uh, can you join us on the 26th in the morning? Uh, make sure I'm not muted here. Sorry. Um, I have a hard stop at 10 a.m., but I am available before that. Okay. Then, okay, then, so, my, then I'll just send my questions in. Yeah. Um, let's try and do it um, as much as possible with the questions submitted in advance, so that we adhere to Doug's limit. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, I, the only concern I have is there's more of a time crunch on this than there are on the regulations. And um, I really think it's beneficial having 10 counselors in the room to kind of use the opportunity. So I'm questioning whether that's it. I, however, have a question about this that I would like made at very public now, and that is, in terms of the two track and field plans is the most that you are asking for in terms of taxation, 1.5 million. In other words, if we don't meet the fundraising and other ways of coming up with the rest of the money, that's the maximum you're going to come to Amherst or to the, to the towns for. Uh, through the regional agreement, yes. If 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 uh, if depending on uh, if we explore the larger project, the larger price tag, some of that may funding may be tax based, uh, but that'll be determinations of each town to decide what and how, and some of it will be depending upon fundraising. But the 
as far as through the regional agreement, one and a half is, is the number uh, that we will use at, as the sort of upper limit through the regional agreement. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Sean might be able to help with this too in the explanation, but uh, the way the process works for those who are not as quite as familiar with it, we set aside a percentage of the, uh, the estimated tax revenue that is then available for uh, capital in each year. And the amount that we uh, have commit ourselves for region expenses gets subtracted from that before and then other debt that we've taken on gets subtracted to that before we can um, get onto the annual capital requests <clears throat> so that uh, as we're getting into the major building projects that we have talked about as a council for uh, now since the council was uh, the first council came into place and the commitments we've already made to the library and anticipate making for an elementary school, school uh, DPW facility and uh, fire station. Uh, we have to factor all of that together, and it it uh, it, it has a balance. And I, um, Sean, I don't know if you want to say anything further about that, or because I think at some point we do need to make a presentation for new counselors about how that works and how it's envisioned. Yeah. So um, as Andy said, when we do our capital planning, we allocate a certain percentage for for capital every year. And the first thing we do is deduct any debt obligations that we have from that amount. And we treat the regional assessment like a debt obligation. It's not technically our debt, but um, it's effectively the same thing because the council authorized the region to take to proceed with that debt. Um, so the regional assessment is also deducted from that top line of what we have for capital every year. Um, so whenever the council authorizes debt, it's you want to understand the impact down the road in terms of what it will do to future capital plans and how much capital is available. Um, for FY23, um, we have estimated out an increase in the regional assessment. You'll see in the capital improvement program that'll be presented in a few weeks um, that we've projected a rise in the regional assessment related to some of these projects. We have not projected it to go all the way up to what you'll see in the regional budget because um, quite frankly, for some of the reasons that have been described, uh, it would use up all our capital. So we have to, I think we have to have more of a discussion about sort of timing and slotting of the projects. Um, and, and the other towns will have to have that same conversation. But we have projected a pretty substantial increase in the regional assessment starting in a couple of years um, and going on for some time uh, to factor in some of these projects. So at some point in, um... And I don't know if you've thought about this, Lynn, but uh, at some point we do need to find a mechanism and a time for a presentation of the entire funding plan for all major capital projects um, for, because uh, we have so many new counselors who have not had the presentation previously. Thank you. I'll look at our budget, our, our agendas and see when we can do that. So let me, there are two people with questions. Let me get to them and then uh, see where we are. At that Andy, um, Guilford messaged me that they can come back if we want to just stick. It may be, we may be at the point where it doesn't make sense to take them anyway. Um, yeah, that's what so, I was going to So maybe we just finish this item out and, and we can invite Amy and Guilford to come back at the next meeting. Yes. Okay. Is that okay with you, Andy? Yes. Okay, then Amy and Guilford, if you're listening, uh, we apologize, but you can come back. Uh, we'll, we'll work with you to schedule an um, uh, uh, agenda item at the next meeting. Kathy, did you have a yeah. question? Uh, well, I just want to uh, build on what you and Sean started saying. I am, we just went through a JCPC uh, reviewing of all the budgets where we were looking at a five-year um, plan. And 
as Sean knows, it was already not completely in balance starting. Uh, 23 looks fine. It's 24, 25, 26 that don't look as well. And we've got other big things coming down the pipeline because it was already drawing on reserves. So I don't personally see how we can make a decision on an authorization that goes even higher than what Shauna already had in um, the budget for the regional schools without a much bigger discussion. So it's not just educate the counselors on it, but we're being asked to make a decision in the next 60 days that to the extent I understand it affects a five to 10 year capital plan in a way that um, makes me really uncomfortable. You know, if we, if we, especially if we include the track, Lynn, at even we say it's no more than 1.5 spread over 20 years or 30 years. Um, it, it was, uh, yes. So I'll just stop there because it feels like I'm, I'm willing to come back to this at the next, but this seems like we're making a piece of a, a decision on a piece without looking at the whole. And that doesn't work well for me. Um, so I can't kind of ask more questions about this other than the two numbers, Doug, when I, go back and look at the 10% or the 10.5% we're holding out of the levy, um, unless you miraculously find that Amherst College or UMass would like to finance our track. <laughs> you know, I mean, that you know, Dorothy's idea, there's some deep pockets out there. I don't see how this works within our 23, 24, 25, 26, because any decision we make is a multiple year decision when we do a debt authorization. So I'm just going to stop there on my discomfort on signal, singling out one piece. I'm um, going to recognize uh, Sean and Lynn first, but I want to just uh, point out that the 60 days is running already that it's 60 days started on march 15th and we are committed to may 2nd as the date to make a council decision on this because we need to do it at a council meeting within the 60-day framework and uh Lynn, do you have anything else to add on that my comment really was broader than that. So just come back to me later. Thank you. Sean? I was going to ask Lynn if she could put up the um, the track and field PowerPoint again. I just want to point out to people, um, there's a difference between the debt schedules that are in the regional budget and the debt for this specific project. Um, and I just want to really highlight the debt for this specific project so that you have a sense of what that is on an annual basis. Um, and Doug, you know, thanks to Doug for putting this uh, presentation together. Is this what you mean? Sean? Yeah. So if you go down to where I think it talks about the Amher share. Uh, right there. Good. So um, this shows you a few things. So one is the local taxation based on the 1.5 million. So that's that bottom table. So it's, it would be roughly, you know, it would peak at 128,000 per year and decline. So this is within what we've projected, Kathy, in that five-year plan yeah. as of right now. I know there's other projects that will go into that, but just so you you kind of have yeah. a sense, we've projected that debt or assessment for the region going up to 800,000. Um, it's currently at 380 or th somewhere in the 300s, and some of that debt will also be paid off in the coming years. So. So again, when I talked about we've increased it to allow for some of these larger projects, that's what I'm talking about. So this would be within that 800,000, um, but it will mean trade-offs with other projects. Um, and then the top chart is CPA. So the region already did go to CPA and uh, present this project. CPA put it on hold because they wanted, um, I think they were interested, They, the general consensus was I think more interest in the larger project. Uh, using CPA for the larger project and less so if it was just the, the smaller version of the project. Um, so that's what that portion would look like coming out of CPA each year. Um, and then the, you know, the, sort of the, the remaining piece is the town would need to come up with roughly another million dollars or so or uh, 890,000 um, in order to meet the Amherst share um, and that the 
timeline that Doug talked about. In order for Amherst to meet its share, we'd have to come up with that other source of funds. Um, so that'll require, I think, ongoing conversations about if if the town is interested in pursuing this project, where does that come from? Um, there's different sources it could come from. It could come from capital. It could come from reserves. It could come from uh, you know, potentially ARPA. Um, but it, we need a, a bigger conversation, I think, to, to decide. I think some of the discussion I've heard is that in order to do effective fundraising, there needs to be some sign of investment by the town. Um, I think it's, what I've heard is it's harder to fundraise if there's zero investment set aside for the town. So some of these votes to allocate funds to the larger project, I think, go a long way um, in, in allowing fundraising to be successful. Um, so just keep that in mind as well as right now there's zero set aside for this project or maybe maybe 75,000 dug in stabilization from a prior year or something like that, <laughs> like that set aside for, for either of these projects. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, the options in front of the council are to vote yes, vote no, or do nothing. And if you do nothing, that's effectively a yes vote. Um, if you vote no, it all it takes is one town to vote no on the debt authorization for that debt authorization to fail. Um, so of no vote means Sorry, this isn't happening. It has to go back to to the school committee. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, back to you and then to Mandy. So what this raises for me is the need for us to go back to uh, the larger um, presentation about overall capital and debt that includes the four big capital projects and a time to do an update with the council. And I'll consult with John, with Paul and Sean as to when we might do that. Um, and so that it is available um, and if it can be available in a timely way, it's no small, job to update that present that whole model. But I think that this is raising for all of us the question of our debt ceiling, our debt, uh, what we're asking for in taxes, and the values we have for our community, which is kind of all wrapped up in all of that. Yes, and of course, um, eventually, as we move along with the elementary school project and uh, we're going to be getting into the question of what we ask for voters in a debt exclusion override which is essentially where we're asking them to allow us to raise more taxes in order to increase the amount that we're uh, borrowing for capital and funding for capital um, that's not already in the local taxation type of um, allocation. So these are important issues for the council as a whole. Um, Mandy. Thank you. Um, as with Lynn, I think we need some more information. I look at the debt budget on 164, which I know is just like estimates and all of that, but on page 164, um, that combines the projected FY23 debt into FY24, 5, 6, and 7, but yet we're being asked to authorize the FY23 debt. And so I, I'd like to see a new debt budget debt schedule that has that includes all the already approved ones which i think is includes the roof debt for the middle school that's a line that seems like it's projected and but that's already passed so that's going to happen um fy21 debt has already been authorized fy22 debt has already been authorized but fy23 is not set out separately please set out separately the fields please set out separately the rest of the fy23 debt and then maybe separately from that 24, 25, 26, and then somehow for Sean, incorporate that into our CIP plan um, so that we can really see as it relates to Amherst, what that looks like. Um, and a couple of questions. Didn't last year or the year before the town council authorize and allocate CPA funds to the track project? And so what happened to that? Um, and uh, 
my bigger one is if the fundraising isn't enough by January, I know you put a deadline in to cover a larger project, do the towns have an, another opportunity to say, hey, we do want to do it and make up that difference or not? Or is this vote that final vote? Because I guess I, I recognize the need for to push fundraising forward, the towns to be in it. But right now, the towns are just in it with a project, not that project or another project. And so that's that's part of my concern is you're asking us to authorize one and a half million without indication as to which project it's being it, it will go to. And and that's I, I'm very uncomfortable with that versus authorizing one and a half million for X project or one and a half million for Y project or not or yes or both or, you know, I, I'm just uncomfortable with, well, if we don't raise the money, we'll spend that anyway on a project that we're not sure the town's support or not. Um, and so I, I struggle with that and, and would like to find a way to really say yes to say the larger project or no to the larger project. And the way the authorizations and the votes are now, we, we can't one way or the other because it's just for a project. So we can't indicate our support one way or the other. So if I may, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. Uh, just back to your original comment about the CPA. Yes, the, the Amherst CPA did uh, fund, and I'm drawing a blank on the amount, uh, I want to say about $150,000 of, of CPA funds. Uh, and it was required, it, it's available for use, does in, include the need to, to do the larger project that rotates the track. Uh, that would reduce this CPA number. Uh, this is based on the totality of this. So it, it's in a sense already, uh, you know, 150 or so thousand of that 947 has, has been uh, has been approved. Um, this is, you know, there would be an additional ask, quite frankly, for the for the, the, the differential there. Um, and and really, that's about uh, when when we came to the CPA earlier this year. That was the differential is about 800 thousand. So it's it's right in the neighborhood of, of the same uh, total ask of the project for for CPA for Amherst. <clears throat> Are there any other, uh, you know, the thing is, is that if, if the regional schools, um, if they did two distinct authorizations, then, uh, and the four communities um, said yes to both of those, now we have an authorization for $3 million, and we have the authority to then borrow that money and, and assess you that money. And so that's part of why they, it's a single authorization that was brought before you with two options available was so as not to uh, essentially put on the books uh, a larger amount of authorization. Um, and again, it's a, and, and part of the rationale for that is because it is a passive yes, if you don't take action, um, uh, you know, we didn't want to put anyone in that bind where they had to formally say no or formally say yes to both. And, and if something were to happen, <clears throat> and you know, we've experienced this where you know, deadlines are not met because of COVID or whatever, uh, and, and telling you get shifted in, in ways that, that don't allow them uh, to, to take action. Um, you know, the, we didn't want to put a, a, any particular town in, in that sort of circumstance. At the same time, I think that, um, you know, the, the best way I would suggest is, is that if you are supportive of, of a larger project would be to, I mean, this is my opinion, so take it for that. It's not necessarily school committee or anything. otherwise would be, to vote to authorize the one and a half million, and then vote to, uh, you know, or or take action by, you know, by the town of Amherst to cover those other amounts of money needed for that larger project, and to do everything you can to encourage your your other member towns to to carry their weight as well, and and to help with the fundraising. I think that that's the circumstance. Um, you know, the the. Uh, the school committee still retains the sort of choice of what the actual project is and, and its implementation, and, and they will make that choice in, in January. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and I don't think that the, the project and the need to sort of, as the superintendent said, the safety factor relative to that track is one that doesn't allow for delay. And so um, them making a decision in early January of next year allows us to get the process rolling uh, and, and the construction process in, in the design and then subsequently construction process moving as quickly as we can. Um, so the, you know, it, it does put you in an odd spot because it's not a specific project. I fully understand and, and, and get that. I think that, um, you know, the, as the superintendent said, the, the indication from the discussion to school committee is a very supportive of the larger project. Uh, and so it's really, I think in, in, 
in voting to authorize, I think then if you want the larger project, then it's about uh, each of the four communities working together to, to find a way to find that other funding and make that project happen. And I think the school committee is supportive of that larger project. Um, so I think it's really, uh, it, it, it puts us in an uncomfortable spot, but we're in a bit of a chicken and egg circumstance around this as far as you know, trying to do fundraising with you know, and, and needing some some concrete steps by communities so that fundraisers can, uh, and and donors can have some confidence in what they're donating toward, uh, and and at the same time it puts uh, each of the communities in a little bit of an awkward spot because they're they're authorizing a project, and what you're really authorizing is a replacement of the track at a minimum. It's you know sort of the minimum thing you're going to do is replace the track, which is desperately in need of being replaced, and uh, you know there is an option available for a larger project. And let's see two hands up I'm gonna, but I'm gonna just take the privilege for a second. So I, I tend to view it as a vote pretty much as Doug described it, in which is why I think I uh, don't share the feeling that we need to know exactly which project it is to go forward because the question for me is at a minimum, do we want to have a credible track and field program for the Amherst Regional Schools. And if it's important to have a credible track and field program, uh, uh, which I think is, uh, there are lots of reasons I can put forward for saying that it is, then it is worth going with the project if it was only Yes, I'd like to see it be more. I hope it's more. I think that uh, making that initial commitment increases the opportunity that it is more. But uh, I, in the end, it's going to be voting on uh, the assumption that in the uh, lowest scenario, worst case scenario, it is just for the limited purpose. But I think it's an important limited purpose. But that's a decision that each counselor we're all going to have to make for ourselves. Michelle, you're next. Thank you. Um, and I do want to acknowledge as a new counselor and as a new member of the Finance Committee, this is a lot to digest. Um, and so I really appreciate any efforts um, to give uh, counselors more background or more time for discussion within the time frame that we have. Um, and to keep us abreast to any additional conversations that may be or that may occur around this that um, would be helpful for us. Um, I have two questions. The first is um, just a curiosity around how long this track, how long was it known that this track was in need of repair or replacement? And was there any sort of reserves that were being set aside and and sort of generally as a practice, if we know that there's something that is deteriorating or will need replacement, um, how does that get handled? Uh, and then more specifically, I'm curious if we are as a council able to vote on an amended authorization to force a greater investment from the community or is it sort of just a yes, no um, choice for us? So I'll answer the second one first. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a yes, no. Uh, the, the, uh, the authorization comes from the regional school committee. Uh, they make the recommendation for, for uh, a borrowing. And then each of the four towns has an opportunity to uh, accept or reject that uh, within that 60 day time frame. But you, you really can't alter that authorization that is under the purview of the, of the regional school committee. Um, regarding the general you know, uh, issues around the track, it's, it's planning and project planning around this. Um, you know, we've had conversations. We've known the track was was in uh, a poor state of repair for a while. It's gotten uh, increasingly worse. Um, you know, we you know the regional schools in cooperation with the town of Amherst uh, did a uh, recreation working group for the downtown area. So there's a number of fields throughout the downtown. Uh, we we partnered with Weston and Sampson to to do a bit of a master planning process relative to those those fields, and partly because we knew that the there was a fairly large capital ask. Uh, in, in regard to this track and, and the other fields in and around the downtown area that, that are, it's gonna be difficult to sort of realize the master plan. Um, and, and we knew that a big 
first step would be the replacement of the track. So it's been known for a number of years. Um, and, and, you know, pandemic didn't do anybody any favors relative to timing and getting started. But I think the difficulty we've run into also is it is such a large and multifaceted uh, from a funding standpoint project. Um, because, you know, once we sort of know the numbers of what it takes to do it, we also recognize we can't just assess that through our regional uh, process. We need to have support from other things like donations and, and grants and gifts and, and other things. Uh, and so that makes it a lot more complex, which invariably makes things go a little bit slower. So that's that slowed things down. But again, uh, you know, the difficulty we're facing is that the tracks continue to deteriorate. So time is not on our side uh, in as much as we've started looking at this in earnest in the last, you know, uh, four or five years. Uh, we've been looking at this uh, in, in earnest and, and really being in some ways kind of perplexed at, at how difficult a task and what what potential avenues we could explore to try to move this thing forward. So, you know, we've kind of been pressed into uh, forcing people, you know, forcing decisions in you know, people's hands in some respects by, by the nature of the project and the status that we're in. And so we've had to kind of, um, in, a, in a way, sort of forge ahead relative to, to some actionable steps that people uh, can take. And hopefully we can still uh, execute on that larger plan, which I think most people are in support of just because they recognize the, the value it brings both the Reading School and the Center of Amherst. Andy, is it okay if I add to that quickly? Yes. Um, so as Doug mentioned, we've known about it for a while. When, um, when the track came up on the region capital plan, when it was just a track replacement, um, the decision was made at that time, you know, mostly driven by the athletic director to explore this larger project. Um, because at that same time, we were having lots of field condition issues. Um, it was a year that there was a lot of droughts and the fields were, you know, in really rough shape. Um, so we did, we formed the working group as Doug described, and we had a, a strategic plan put together. And at that time, the strategic plan gave a very wide range of costs. I think it said it could cost anywhere from $2 million to $6 million to, to do this project. Um, so it was helpful, but not super helpful because it wasn't a, a detailed dive into a specific project. Um, we did set, set aside a, a little bit of money. Doug would have to go back and look and see what those contributions were. When the region had good years, we did put a little bit into stabilization funds specifically for this project. However, the region has not had many good years where we were able to do that, but there was at least one I recall. Um, and then, so after we had the strategic plan, uh, as Doug mentioned, we were able to go back, or I think Doug went and got CPA funds uh, to start diving into this project further. Um, and just in the past several months, we were able to get the more detailed cost estimate um, of what this project would be. I think sometime in, was it December or January, Doug? Maybe a little um, bit we, after that. We engaged with them. They finished up in uh, sort of mid-February. Okay, that we got the, the more specific 4.7 uh, price tag. Um, so it's been a long time, a lot of planning, sort of thinking about what this could be. Um, and then as Doug mentioned, the pandemic didn't help in terms of moving everything forward. Thank you. Bernie, let's see. Um, yeah, I would, I, I'd, I'd feel, uh, I think more comfortable if I knew exactly what we were buying. And, uh, you know, so Doug's statement that you're, we're, we're basically voting for the minimum plan um, is, uh, is, is helpful. Uh, I'm curious as to how much conversation has gone into this, these options in terms of the use of CPA money. Uh, because option four, which has the AstroTurf, the artificial turf in it, um, adds even more complications in terms of doing that and using CPA money. So um, you, you basically, you're basically at that point inviting a separate entity with some uh, legal standing to purchase the and install the, um, uh, the artificial turf, then donate it uh, to the region to get around the, uh, the limitations on CPA money. So uh, this question about how much that's been explored. Um, and, um, uh, you, you know, I think I'd be more comfortable with people saying this, the committee, the school committee saying, uh, we want this and we're going to have it done by this time and this is how we're going to get there rather than to roll out a series of what ifs. Andy, is it okay if I speak to the first one about the CPA? Um, yeah, I think I was going to ask you to do somebody do that. 
Yeah, so so we have spoken with the CPA coalition um, and we've worked with our attorneys on this piece. You're, you're right, it is more complicated because CPA funds can't be used for turf. Um, so that's why the the allocation for CPA is organized the way it is, is that it it's more or less reflective of what the track portion of the project would be, um, which the track is eligible for CPA funds. Um, and so we, but to your point, we would have to have a separate accounting and keep good records of that the CPA funds are for a portion of the project and not the whole project. Um, and in a similar fashion as the discussion that happened um, on the CPA recommendations recently, if we if the town was to invest a significant amount of CPA funds into the region, um, we would be looking for uh, similar types of uh, deed restrictions or restric restrictions similar um, when we purchase recreation uh, recreational land on the track uh, portion of that project. So it, it would it would provide some assurance that it would remain a track into the future. Thank you. I just suggest that sometimes simple is the best way to go. Yeah. Um, and um, you, you know, I, the track's been a need for for quite some time. It's been obvious. We have lots of capital needs. And we keep dancing around them. Um, it's uh, so I'm I'm glad to see that people are really taking this on. But uh, uh, you know, a, a more explicit statement about this is this is the project, um, and this is how we're going to accomplish it would be uh, welcomed. Thanks. Now the council is going to have to <clears throat> deal with the question of what we're allowed to do with CPA funds as will the CPA committee. I mean, both have to come to a similar conclusion to allow it to go forward. Um, but for those who are unfamiliar, there is a provision in the Community Preservation Act that's passed by the legislature that uh, was created at a time when there was particular concern about the safety of artificial turf fields of saying that uh, CPA money cannot be used for artificial for projects that, uh, that are artificial turf fields. And uh, that's the, uh, what we're trying to address in this question. I think we have to decide both how we feel about as a region and as four different towns about uh, having a artificial turf field. And then secondly, uh, where how we can engineer um, the use of CPA funds to advance the project and be consistent with the statute. Uh, Sean, do you have anything to add to that? Then let's just see what Bob has to say and then I'm gonna have to draw this to a close. Yeah, the one other thing I'll add quickly, just so everyone is aware of um, what, what, what else would have to happen. Um, in order for us to borrow from CPA, um, we would have to form some sort of intermunicipal agreement with the region. Um, we've spoken, uh, the region and the town have the same bond council, that's the, the legal council that helps structure debt authorizations and things like that. Um, and we've had a preliminary conversation with bond council of how, if this did go forward, how it would work. Um, and so our bond council has, has drafted these types of agreements for other communities um, that are part of regional schools, uh, between communities and regional school systems. Um, but just so people are aware, it would require some sort of special agreement between the town and the and the regional school district. But that's not unusual because we did that just for the construction project to add to and renovate the high school. So is it really different? What, or the one back in, um, in the, that, that might have been before I started at the school, so it'd be a while ago. Yeah, but there is precedent, that's all yep. the point. Bob, did you have anything that you wanted to add in questions? Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask or pose a couple of questions. The first is that um, I'm a little bit concerned about the potential for getting into a budget problem if we have a severe inflation or more inflation in the materials costs and whether that's built into the budget or not. And then the second question I have, and maybe I missed this or maybe I just haven't seen all the documentation, but what, what are we, how long would the track and the fields last uh, under the various options? And what are the annual maintenance costs for each of those, because I think we need to be looking at this 
from a broad perspective of not only how much do we have to borrow or, or somehow raise to get it in the first place, but what are the ongoing costs that are already going to be going to be, going to be added to an already tight um, regional school budget? Um, <clears throat> so I can take into consideration that. Uh, so in the in the projected estimates, there is some some inflationary components uh, factored in. You know whether or not the recent trend in the last few months is is really fully uh, you know articulated. There's is is not likely, uh, but nonetheless the the uh, sort of material and labor cost increases in, in, a, in a project like this over time have, have been factored in. Some overages for for uh, cost overruns are are part of the of the projection of the 4.7, so uh, and the 1.5. Um, you know, those are definitely you know in there. Um, you know, obviously, if 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 uh, you know we stay at six, seven, eight percent inflation, it's going to be a decidedly uh, tougher. Uh, project to get to, and and longer wait, more expensive it gets too. So it's kind of a uh, you know uh, rock and hard place uh, circumstance in some respects that way uh, relative to those costs. Um, on the second point, uh, you know a few of those things have been uh, kind of teased out in some of the you know some of the materials that came with the original master planning document, but also in in the more recent Weston and Sampson work that we had to do to refine the numbers. Um, the, the short story is that. Uh, when you look at sort of the field itself, the sort of interior field uh, maintenance, you know, when you consider the 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 cost of installation, the you know year-over-year -year maintenance, because uh, both natural surfaces and 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 uh, uh, artificial surfaces have year-over-year -year maintenance, um, and the difference in playing time, uh, you you tend to get a uh, you know the very comparable natural surface versus uh, an artificial surface as far as cost per. Per year per square foot, you know that type of thing. However, what you get really that I think is the huge advantage with an artificial surface is about two and a half to three times the playing time, uh, and and uh, you have a lot uh, easier time scheduling because you don't have to wait for you know fields to dry out that sort of thing. Um, so I think that the, that larger project is is fairly cost effective. Um, I think the other thing that, that factors in that's a little more subtle is you know by moving the location uh, the uh, Efficiency with which we're using the fields goes up. Uh, so the the number of playing fields and the amount of time and and uh, spaces we have are more efficiently used and sort of more effectively used than what we currently have as far as how we're structured. So there's a lot of pluses to to the larger uh, rotation of the track and and, and that uh, as part and parcel of of a, of a project um, versus keeping it in place. The track itself, the surface of the track. Um, Roughly about 20 years. Uh, the surface, if you go with the, you know, a grass field, it's every year maintenance, and, and depending on how much you use it, we tend to overuse our fields as they currently exist. And so, uh, you know, we're always playing catch up, trying to get them to, to a reasonable playing standard. Um, but a, a, an artificial surface, about a 10 year window, is, is considered a typical life uh, lifespan for those uh, before you need to, to replace them. Although once you have one in place, uh, the replacement cost. Uh, is a little it is less. It's still expensive when you go to replace a, an artificial surface, but the infrastructure that goes underneath it uh, is is more durable and lasts longer than you will just replacing sort of uh, the surface materials when you when you do a replacement at that sort of ten year plan. Some of them last longer, up to fifteen, but you know uh, I think the reasonable estimate for life span on an artificial surface is about ten years. So then, if I understand correctly, and Andy, I'm starting to prolong this, but we'd still be paying off the debt on the artificial field when we have to incur more debt or more cost to replace it. Is that correct? No, not really, because you can't borrow for longer than the life of, of the thing you borrow for. So if if you if that you looked at the slide deck, you'll notice that the payments in the first 10 years are decidedly higher than the, uh, and, and, you know, like almost triple the ones in the last 10 years. And part of that's mm -hmm. because the borrowing for the, the uh, you know, the artificial surface would I be... See. Pro, you know, prorated over a 10 year period, whereas the track would be prorated over a 20 year period. So okay. we have to borrow for lengths of time that match the life of the, whatever it is we're buying. Okay, but but again, the project is going to be more expensive in the long run than what we're actually putting out now because we're going to have to replace the artificial. If we chose to go to the artificial field turf, we'd have to replace that in 10 or 15 years um, versus just having a field of grass that needs to be maintained. Right, and, and you know, as I say, you know, the, the sort of year over year costs and, you know, for maintenance on uh, 
and and usability of a grass surface, you know, are the cost per year um, are comparable uh, between you know the, an artificial surface and a natural surface. The 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 amount of rest that's needed, the amount of uh, you know seeding, reseeding, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those those labor costs are decidedly higher on a year over year basis. So it, it, in totality, you know, you you run into um, a similar overall price structure over time. You just take it big hits at the beginning of each cycle. Um, and then your, your year over year costs for an artificial service and yearly maintenance is much, much lower. Um, but then you have a big spike when you do a replacement. So it's, it's sort of differences in when you pay, but you end up paying about the same. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, uh, since Pam's been here all, and hasn't asked any questions. I just do, let's see if you have anything which you wanted to ask. Yeah, I was gonna, <clears throat> sorry, I was gonna ask about the um, the, the um, changeover or the, the improvements to the field. So if the track gets reoriented, whether it, whether it gets a turf field or not, let's just say it goes, it, it gets reoriented. Where do we see in the budget the, Costs for upgrading um, the entire remaining field area. In other words, the the rest of the grass areas. Uh, it occurred to me that in the conversation about uh, the elementary schools, that there were costs associated with bringing up um, playing fields as as part of the cost, or not part of the cost, but there is a cost to improving the grass fields as well. And where in our outgoing budgets um, do we see those costs accounted for? Thanks. So I think that there is some, um, <clears throat> in the process of sort of moving the track and, and you know, there'll be some earthwork that'll need to be done where the track currently exists. Um, the idea would be is in the future that that potentially could, could be the location of a softball field uh, oriented properly to, to the sun. Um, but that would be a separate capital project if it needed. I mean, there'll be some basic uh, amount of work done there. So it is a playable space. Uh, will it be fully a, a, a softball uh, facility? No, it will, will not. That would be a separate capital ask at a future time. And I think that's you know to be determined. I think as far as the year over year maintenance of those grass spaces for use, which they would be for, for practices, games, and et cetera, uh, you know, it's still a usable and playable space and will be used for that. And, and so those will be built in our operating budgets to cover those, those costs of, of uh, you know, water, seed, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Um, we do need to move it along and conclude the meeting in just one. Um, so I'm going to do that. But uh, Sean, did you have anything else that you I just wanted to? say a couple of really quick points. Um, one, this project does include quite a, uh, a substantial accessibility improvement um, to get students in wheelchairs with other accessibility issues down to the field that doesn't currently exist. So um, I just want to point that out. Um, and then to Bob's questions about maintenance, I think that's a, something that we've talked a lot, a lot about. Um, and there's two pieces to that. One is if there's fundraising, I think our goal or a goal should be that there's fundraising for maintenance and that that would be put, in, put aside into a fund for ongoing maintenance maintenance of the turf. Um, the other piece that would be unique is that a turf facility can actually generate revenue through rental um, throughout the year. And what we're told is it can generate quite a bit of revenue. And I think another expectation that Amher should set is that that revenue is put aside into a, into a maintenance fund as well. Um, so that when it does come time to replace the turf, a sizable portion of that can be paid out of that maintenance fund. Um, the, the region already has a, a revolving fund set up for that type of purpose. So it would really be just making sure that that um, expectation is set. Okay. Uh, Jennifer. Okay. I, I, I would just, um, that was a really important point that Sean just made. If, um, you know, we could get that more up front and center, maybe in future conversations that that uh, surface could be revenue generating that I just want to throw that in. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, so what I was, uh, to draw this to a conclusion, we agreed that we would uh, uh, encourage additional questions to be submitted in writing that we will uh, 
uh, try and organize them and get them to uh, Doug and Mike for um, their consideration. Um, what I'd like to propose is, is, is a schedule and I will send an email out to the council tomorrow. Probably will not get it done this afternoon because of another event that I need to get to. But um, if people can um, get the questions to us by Friday, that'd be helpful. But uh, I had set a hard deadline of the 19th, the day after Patriots Day, a week from today. And that's the day that we'll, I'll try and um, bundle the questions um, in an organized fashion. And uh, then um, probably if Sean is available to help, uh, use his help to get them to Doug and Mike. Uh, and uh, we will um, then have, as noted previously, <clears throat> the public hearing, which will not be um, a discussion as a public hearing for that purpose, but I'm hoping we can uh, limit that because the council discussion will be later, though I think that's ultimately up to Lynn to help organize as to how she wants to organize the time for the uh, council meeting, of which this is a part on the 25th. 26th, there's going to be a um, the final meeting of the finance committee in which uh, we'll uh, come back with the questions. And Doug will be with us for the first part of that meeting to um, for uh, focusing on the questions that um, are proposed through this process. And then the Finance Committee will need to meet to make a recommendation on both capital and on the um, operating budgets for the uh, regional schools and uh, get so that it can get in a report in time for council consideration and discussion on May 2nd. Uh, so that's the process we're going forward with. If there are no questions about that, then um, I, the, the last items, there's been nobody, uh, no attendees um, that I'm in, in the audience, so we don't need to do public comment. Um, I just need a couple minutes um, on the process for the May meetings, anybody's interested in that, we should do that, but um, we want to make that really quick, but I do want to uh, talk about how the process works and the schedule, uh, just uh, so uh, that's forbearance of the committee on that. Lynn, I'd, your hand I'd like off. to go ahead and adjourn the full council meeting since the rest of this really only pertains to the finance committee, okay? Okay, Michelle. you're welcome to stay, but I, um, I just want to make sure you can go because it's been a long morning. Okay, I'd like to say thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time, and I'll happy to answer questions you have. So we'll see. Thanks, you soon. Doug. Okay, thank you, Doug. Again. Thank you, Doug. Really appreciate it. Andy, I have to leave, um, and I, I would, I don't want to miss the process piece, so I can follow up with mm -hmm. you you know, later if that's needed or if that can happen at the next meeting. Um, um, let me just tell you real quickly, maybe Lynn can, this will only take a second to do this, uh, the very first part of it. And then uh, you'll be, if you duck out, I understand. Uh, Lynn, could you put up that uh, thing that I gave sent to this morning, just real quick. Uh, and uh, what it is, is, uh, a process that's really similar to what we've used in prior years. Um, and it involves participation of committee members. And so at the next meeting, we will need to um, make some final decisions. I'll try and work something out. But we try and get um, have each of the members of the Finance Committee, the eight of us, take on um, some responsibility separate for, um, for each of the items and um, how we would go forward. So if you look at what we do, we have various committee members who are assigned to review each department and solicit questions ahead of time. And uh, 
that uh, me doesn't mean that questions shouldn't be thought about from all members of the committee, but it's helpful to have one member of the committee who does take primary responsibility to focus on a particular um, issue. Um, we're going to have a very tight schedule, which uh, Lynn can also put on the screen, but you may have seen it already. But uh, each what we were thinking of is that we're going to ask the departments to limit their um, overview um, to five to 10 minutes. And um, then uh, that will allow us to uh, then get questions and discussion from other members of the committee. And uh, what uh, the additional item, if you have it available, is just the grid, get that which shows where each department is. You just had it on the screen for a second one. Uh, but uh, that uh, those, um, I'll, we'll make sure that those <coughs> come back out to you uh, so that you can focus on what it is. But uh, I will be looking for people to express interest about if they have a, a particular uh, department that our second group of departments that they're interested in, because uh, we also look to the people who've taken on that responsibility to help with drafting the report after the uh, meeting is done, and then we start moving towards what we're going to report back to the council on each of these areas. So, any comments or questions about process? Seeing no questions, um, we have no public comment required today because there's no members of the public um, who are um, present, which then gets us back to the, um, this, has anybody um, had a chance to look at the minutes of March 29th that were in the packet? Any suggestions for amendments, changes to the minutes? Does anybody want to make a motion to it? Lynn? Yeah, I move that we accept the minutes for um, March, March 29th. 29th, 2022. As presented, since nobody has, um, has proposed any amendments as their second. I will second it so we can move this along. Um, and uh, let's just take a quick vote and then I think we can adjourn. Um, Lynn? Yay. And uh, Bob, did you, you're okay with the minutes? I'm fine with them. Yep, Matt. Bernie, either of you have any? Question. Second, okay, uh, Michelle, I think you had to leave. Uh, Kathy? Yes. No, I'm a yes. Um, Andy, Andy, I just have I just have one comment. I'm a reluctant yes because I actually didn't read them. So um, what I I'm hoping in the future when we do this. Would you tell us that you've read them and made any minor changes in them? I'm just, I'm, you know, in the past, I always did a review and almost never had any more than a minor edit, but I just, I feel a little, since there are only three of us, I didn't want to abstain because you wouldn't have had a majority vote on the minutes, but it's just a request for the future. Okay. Um, no, I did look at the minutes and I think they're fine. Um, I think these were, uh, written by Athena. And I think that, you know, she is always very straightforward and uh, makes sure that um, all legal aspects of that are required in minutes are taken care of. Yeah, it, my only point is I would like to have known that, know that one person has read them besides the minute taker. So that's, that's it. Just if you could make that statement, 
for the next time. Yeah. I'm just, no, I'm just uh, okay. if you ask a question, I wouldn't say that. So um, I don't think that we have anything else. Uh, we know when the next meeting is, we know what the process is going forward. I will send something out. So thank you very much and thank, appreciate thanks, everybody's everyone. forbearance with what was very long but productive meeting. Bye. Bye.